Okay. Good morning, students. It's really nice to see you all again. And uh, but I'm again interacting with you all. And uh, regarding your law of thoughts and jurisprudence, I hope you all are preparing yourselves and uh, going through the important questions that I've given you for your, sorry, for your practice. And um, I hope and I believe that you will do well. Still, if you have any questions, even on that subject, you are free to ask me. Okay, so uh, today, there's someone else joining. Okay, so today, uh, I mean, from today, we are going to learn the law of contracts. I'm sure you have heard about the term contract and, uh, uh, you know, contract, I mean, uh, I mean, you must have heard any number of times, you must have heard about businesses entering into contract. You must have just read in the news also about contracts. But uh, do you know that even when you go to a shop to say, purchase say, an ice cream. So do you know even that amounts to a contract? So we never realize that uh, the transactions that we enter into, you know, day to day. So that, you know, it amounts to a contract. We don't even realize we purchase some grocery in a grocery store that amounts to a contract. If you remember that we studied in the Nahu versus Stevenson, which is a landmark decision in the law of torts. So that is a classical and a historical decision. So since I've already taken, you know, the, I mean, I'm, I'm just reminded of that case. So just uh, for a moment deviating from the subject of contract, just to remind you even about uh, the law of contract, your answers, wherever relevant, has to mention uh, the case of Donahu versus Stevenson because that's a landmark judgment and it, you must, 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 uh, you know, um, somehow you must write uh, this, uh, you know, this case law. It's uh, a very important case law. So if you remember the facts of this coming back to the concept of contract, if you remember about this, um, you know, this case where, you know, the court uh, or in the court of law there was in the house of lords rather there was um you know uh, an argument between the lawyers saying that uh, there was no real you know contract or there was no real agreement between donahu the lady who consumed the ginger beer and the vendor as well as the you know the manufacturer of the ginger beer because it was actually her friend who had purchased the ginger beer for her. So uh, do you remember that I, I explained to you this case and I said that when, uh, you know, one of the argument or contentions of the lawyer was there was no real agreement between Donahu as well as uh, between Donahu and Stevenson who was the manufacturer of the ginger beer. On, on the other hand, they said that there was no you know, real relationship or contractual relationship that makes Donahu entitled to be the plaintiff in the case. On So on the grounds of that, the lawyer for Stevenson said, uh, there is no privity of contract. There is no contract between the parties directly. So therefore the case should be thrown out. But of course, this is a law of tort, but you see how all the things are actually interconnected. So therefore, coming, uh, you know, trying to remind you of that and bringing you back to the concept of contract. Even when you go to buy a simple thing as an ice cream or go to the grocery store, or even when you board, say, um, a public transport, it could be a taxi or it could be a bus, any public transport system, you like knowingly, unknowingly, you somehow enter into a contract. So now what is this contract? Simply speaking, contract is an agreement between the parties that in case there is a breach of it, that means what is breach? That means if either party does not honor their part of the contract or their term of the contract, that means the other party who is entitled to be served according to the whatever is the one minute. Uh, whatever is a transaction between the parties, when the other party does not comply with, it makes the party who's entitled to receive the benefit to, you know, get his complaint redressed in the court of law. That means 
here the concept of breach of contract comes in, which entitles the other party to knock the doors of the court to get the terms of the contract honored, or in case there is a loss as a result of that breach, to get the compensation for the loss or recover the loss through a court of law. So contract is nothing but an agreement between the parties to render maybe probably goods or maybe services, goods or services. It could be a professional contract, it could be a services contract, it could be employment contract uh, between the employer and the employee, and uh, it could be business contract, international contract, it could be any form of, you know, agreement or some kind of terms which is agreed between two or more parties to do something and to bind themselves by the law that in case there is a breach of it, it enables the parties to knock the doors of the court to get it redressed. So having said that, let's go through our slides. Today, I will not, you know, uh, uh, you know, burden you with a lot of information. <laughs> Sorry. Today, I'll just give you, um, you know, just a general insight into the subject and slowly we'll start going into the concepts, but this is just at the introductory stage. Okay, so the first chapter in the law of contract is, of course, the introduction. And I'll not complete the formation of contract, but I will just stick to introduction today a little bit. I will slowly enter into formation. Now, today, most area of our lives, you know, as I said earlier, and you also know that today, most of the area of our lives are governed by a contract. You can take tenancy contract if the uh, the the house, flat, or whatever, warehouse, go down, anything is on rent or lease. So that is a tenancy contract or a lease contract. So today, most area of our lives are governed by a contract. Now, contract refers to, again, in simple terms, an arrangement between parties who desire, <coughs> sorry, an arrangement between parties who desire to govern their relationship and or specific dealing transaction or mutually agreed terms which may be expressed either verbally or in writing. So therefore, contract involves agreement between parties to be governed by a particular set of terms. With the intention of community <laughs> Therefore, I, what I was saying that, mute your mic please. Therefore, contract involves agreement between parties to be governed by a particular set of terms with the intention that in case of breach of those terms, the breaching party may be made accountable for the act of the breach, including the losses that may be caused as a result of such a breach or contravention of the terms agreed and set forth in the contract. Like for example, Say now there is a business contract, okay? And um, say A um, contracts with B to purchase, <coughs> very sorry, to purchase some goods, uh, you know, to be sold at, you know, on a retail basis. So he contracts with the wholesaler. He says, uh, I purchase some goods from you and I will sell it at a retail price. Now say that, the goods he pays uh, an advance to the, uh, Mr. B, who is the wholesaler. <laughs> I'm very sorry, to the wholesaler, and uh, um, the wholesaler later on. Just excuse me.
Okay, so uh, he contracts with the wholesaler saying that, you know, you supply me some goods and um, he would want to sell it at a retail price and he pays, say, an advance to the person and he says that your goods should reach my, there is a terms between them, terms and conditions. So he says that I will pay you an advance at the time of signing the contract. Then he says that when your goods reach my go down, I will pay you the balance amount. Now say that he pays for the advance and uh, you know there is an agreement that the goods should reach the you know the the go down by the end of the month say for example it should reach by the end of the month but go to see b says uh, you know there are some problem and he's not able to deliver on time and say now then again he asks some time from mr a and mr a grants him that time and then again he pulls on for two months and three months and is still not able to deliver the goods as a result say a you know suffers some losses say it's a product in which is much in demand and there are other suppliers as well and he did not contact any other supplier but he just got you know he contracted with this particular supplier who is mr b and as a result of that he has uh you know uh, uh experienced or his business has experienced some losses so what is the recourse for mr a first of all mr a will force mr b to you know you know, on friendly terms to fulfill the terms of the contract. And in case he doesn't do that, in case he's delay dialing and he's taking advantage of the, 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 you know, the mildness of Mr. A and he just keeps on prolonging. And uh, Mr. B say he has the product, but then he sells it to someone else on some other arrangement and some, and A gets to know. So he can first of all file a case uh, in the court of law and ask him for specific performance of the contract that is through the court asking him, please deliver the goods ASAP as soon as possible with the help of the court order. And secondly, what he can do is for all the losses that he has suffered, so he can claim compensation, which can be calculated by the court. Or now here there is a question of liquidated and unliquidated damages. Sometimes in a contract, uh, already like you know, uh, the parties may agree with each other that in case uh, you know of any breach of this, so an X amount would be charged in case the goods are delivered later than this period, uh, which may hamper a particular person's business. So one of the parties' business, so they can have a you know kind of um, particular clause in the contract which say that you will have to pay me say x amount whatever amount so or per day rate or per month per day of delay uh, that is called per day of default or uh, any amount of money so that would call, be called as liquidated damages whether uh, you know the contractual parties agree with each other about uh, the compensation that has to be made in case of <coughs> sorry in case of breach of contract but um, in case of the, uh, you know, where they have not, uh, you know, come to an understanding with respect to breach or any amount, of course, breach is, uh, uh, whenever there's a breach, a party has got the right to redress. But uh, in case there is no term with respect to how much money or how much damages should be paid, that means here the court would calculate the damages. So here the concept of unliquidated damages comes in. Are you understanding me? Unliquidated damages, which is calculated by the court so that's how whenever there is a breach of contract that is there is contravention of the terms you move away from the terms that is agreed which are set forth in the contract it entitles the breach the it entitles the other party uh, you know to uh, receive compensation or get the work done from the party from the breaching party so therefore, a contract involves agreement between parties, two or more parties to be governed by certain terms and conditions which are in, in the form of clauses in a written contract. Next is, therefore you can say that a contract involves agreement because it's an agreement between parties. Now, what is this agreement? So agreement may be defined as an offer that is accepted. Listen carefully, the simple definition and a legal definition according to the contractual law is that agreement is an offer which was accepted. Now, again, when you are talking about offer, uh, so, okay, before that, we can say that there are two elements in an agreement. One is there is an offer and next is there is the acceptance 
of that offer. So therefore, offer plus acceptance is agreement. Uh, this is something that you must know, like you must know, like you must know. It's very simple. There should be someone offering goods for sale, example. And on the other hand, there is someone who's accepting that offer, that is agreement. So offer plus acceptance is an agreement. Okay, now we'll go slowly. Now, an agreement that is enforceable in law is a contract. What means enforceability? Enforceability means, you know, getting yourself bound by law. Your, by, your, the parties are binding themselves by law, saying that in case there is a problem or in case there is a dispute between the parties, they would go and knock the doors of the court or any rights that are um, already, you know, granted by the law, for example, re retaining goods, okay? For example, uh, you know, I gave you an example last time about a tailor that is bailment, it comes under bailment, B-A-I-L-M-E-N-T, bailment in civil law. So that's a type of contract where you give your, um, any of your say dress or clothes for stitching to a tailor and you do not pay the amount what is actually the tailoring charges. And you keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. And then after some time, after some days, the tailor, uh, when there is uh, the time comes for delivery of some other clothes, he would retain the goods so that the law gives him the right to retain the goods until the other party, you know, uh, gives him the tailoring charges. So an agreement that is enforceable in law is a contract. Enforceability is the uh, legal bonding, the legal um, obligation that is attached to it. So again, I'm going back to what is an agreement. I said a contract is an agreement between the parties that is enforceable by law. Enforceability means binding themselves to the legal obligation in case there is a breach, then they got the right to go and knock the doors of the court or exercise that right or enforce that right, which is granted by law to them. Example, to exercise on your own is right to retention of goods till the amount is paid or the amount is released. Now, before that I said now, what is an agreement? Offer plus, offer plus acceptance is an agreement. I'm repeating because this is something very important. What is an agreement? Offer plus acceptance of that offer is an agreement. Pay attention, please, because it's very important. Offer plus acceptance is an agreement. This agreement, when there is enforceability attached to it, becomes a contract. So in contract, I would say that there are three elements. What are the elements? Offer, acceptance, and enforceability. In case we get disconnected, join back, please. So in a contract, there are three elements. Offer, acceptance, that is an agreement. And that, would, when there is enforceability attached to it, it is a contract. You understanding me? Agreement is a, equal to offer plus acceptance. That means contract, what is contract? Offer plus acceptance plus enforceability is a contract. I'm just telling you in simple terms. Now, moving further, an agreement with no intention of enforcing it will not culminate or end up in a contract. The factor of legal enforceability makes an agreement a contract. Thus, all contracts may be agreements, but not all agreements are contracts. Now, this is something very, very important. All contracts may be agreements, but not all agreements are contracts. Sometimes for, exa uh, for your exams, this question may be asked, asked to you like, all contracts may be agreements, 
but not all agreements are contracts. Comment. So you will have to give me what is the meaning of a contract, what is the meaning of an agreement, what are the factors or the elements that are there in a contract, what are the factors and elements that are there in, a, uh, you know, in an agreement and come up with examples. Now, what is the example here? A invites B for a dinner or you invite your friend uh, saying that, okay, let's meet out for dinner. So that's an offer, you're offering, you're inviting, you're offering him or her. So you're telling, come over for dinner, or even to your house, come over for dinner. And then your friend agrees to accept the invitation. It's an agreement. Okay, I agree to come to your place, or I agree to uh, meet you wherever for, and you host for your friend to saying, okay, let's meet for dinner. So there is offer plus acceptance. There's an agreement here. Now the question comes, suppose your friend last moment tells you that, no, I'm not able to come uh, because there is some problem. Now, can you sue that friend in the court of law that your friend did not come for dinner? Or even if you have called him or her to the house and you have prepared a good meal and you have invested something very well, and then finally there's no one to eat it. So what would you do? Does it give you the right to uh, you know, file a case? The answer is simple, no, because this is just a social and a personal understanding or personal agreement where you had no intention to create legal obligation. So this is an example of an agreement. Are you understanding me? Or a father promises son to buy a, a car. I gave you this example as well, a car, a mobile or whatever gift in case the son or the daughter, you know, fares very well in her, his or her exams. Then afterwards, say uh, you finally, son or daughter, you finally score very good marks and the father somehow gets very busy and somehow you, you know, forgets it and he's very busy and he uh, does not have the time to gift you as soon as possible as when you expect it. So can you file a case against your father saying that, no, 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 you agreed with me. You cannot because it's just a personal agreement. It's a social agreement. So therefore, all agreements cannot be, con cannot be called as contracts, but all contracts may be called as agreements. Why? Because, <clears throat> sorry, because there is an element of agreement in a contract. So the agreement which can be enforceable or where the party is, uh, you know, attach the concept of legal obligation to it, saying that make the parties agree that it should be legally binding. The, the enforceability part of it is attached to an agreement that makes it a contract. Therefore, I'm reiterating, all agreements are not contracts, but all contracts are agreements. Or the other way of putting it, all contracts may be agreements, but not all agreements are contracts. I hope you understood this concept. Now, I said that in an agreement, there is offer. So offer plus acceptance is an agreement. So what is this offer? You already know it, but still you have to you know, substantiate your point with a case law and you know, give a, a, you know, a legal explanation to it. What is an offer? So in Storer versus Manchester City Council, 1974, 1WLR 14, not 3, that is a citation, the court set forth that offer is an expression of willingness to contract on specified terms with the intention that is to be binding once accepted. So they have given a, you know, a little heavy meaning of a offer saying that when a person expresses or a party, I would say, a party, that means it could be a company or it could be an individual. So a party with offers, uh, which expresses their willingness to contract on specified terms with the intention that it is to be binding once accepted is called an offer. Now, an offer could also be a proposal to enter into an agreement. You can also define an offer as a proposal to enter into an agreement. An offer may also be defined as a promise that one party makes in exchange for another party's performance or for a consideration. 
So therefore, offer involves two parties. One is the offerer and two, the offering. That means the one who makes the offer is called the offerer and the one to whom the offer is made is called the offering. Are you understanding me? So offer has two parties, one who makes the offer or one who, you know, to whom the offer is made, that's the offering. Next is, what are the essentials of a valid offer? To constitute a valid offer, the following elements must be present. Now we learned about agreement and we said in an agreement, there is this element called offer. Now, what makes a valid offer? So now you have to say that there are certain elements that makes the offer valid in the eyes of law. So what are those things? One, offer must be communicated. Naturally, in case you do not communicate the offer, there is no question of offer. So offer must be communicated. So you might say that, what a, you said that, uh, you know, teacher, you said that if, if I go and uh, purchase something in the shop, you said that it is, um, it amounts to an agreement as well, where the shopkeeper did not come and personally give me an offer. But of course, by virtue of the shop being there, the shop being open, it's a commercial shop. Purpose of the shop is to sell goods and services or sell ice cream in case it's an ice cream shop. So it's an open offer. Whoever needs or wants to buy an ice cream, it's an open offer. So it's a silent communication. It's a communication. It's an open offer. Come, anyone can come and purchase the products that are available in this, you know, shop. This is a direct example. But in law, there are a lot of factors to be considered. Sometimes, you know, silence it depends upon country to country again, how they interpret. Silence, they say, uh, would not always amount to acceptance of the offer. Someone offers, suppose there is an offer, uh, for example, A offers to sell his car to B and tells B, you come and you know uh, get back to me uh, as fast as possible, but he does not give within a time frame. And B does not get back. Then A keeps thinking in his mind, no, he did not come back. So that means it is, he's silent on it. The silence means acceptance. So there are a lot of factors, but silence cannot be acceptance always and most of the times in law. So it depends again, they call it the law of acquiescence there. So again, coming back to offer. So offer must be communicated. It must be communicated with the intention to create legal obligation. That means the party's desire that there has to be a legal obligation. Again, here I've given you the same example of father promising son. And when the father does not comply with the promise, so there was no actual intention to be legally bound in that. So that offer cannot be intended to be, uh, you know, called as to create a legal obligation. So offer must be communicated with the intention to create a legal obligation.